We trust that God is going to bless us through his precious word. We've been looking through the Acts of the Apostles on Wednesday nights. Last time we saw the Apostles being arrested by the leaders of Jerusalem and being put into prison. However, on this occasion, no fewer than 5,000 people were eternally saved. They were converted to Christ. It's almost worth going to prison for that, wouldn't it be? <clears throat> and the Apostles went to prison with a happy heart. The next day they were summoned before the top men, headed by Annas the high priest, and they were asked by what authority and power they'd healed the crippled man. And Peter, speaking in the power of the Holy Spirit, told them that their question showed that they were innocent. <clears throat> they were being examined for a good deed. It was Christ's authority and it was Christ's power that had healed this man. Jesus, whom they had crucified, was raised from the dead by God himself. He was and always would be the only way of salvation, for there was none other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. And they were the last words we read, four great words, we must be saved. Now tonight, we see the reaction to Peter's statement by these leaders from verse 13 onwards. It's a very interesting verse, verse 13. It tells us three things about these apostles. First of all, they were bold. Secondly, they were unlearned and ignorant. And thirdly, they'd been with Jesus. So first of all, it says that they marveled at the boldness of the apostles. So there were these apostles on trial, yet they were accusing their leaders and putting them on trial. And these leaders were lost for words as to what to answer. They felt so guilty within. And Peter and John were so bold. Of course, Peter hadn't always been like that. We've seen that before, haven't we? He was a coward at one time. But when Christ was on trial and he was standing by that, that fire trying to get warm and um, a young servant girl spoke to him and said, you're one of those who are with Jesus. And he said he wasn't. He denied the Lord. But now he's standing before the whole Sanhedrin, the top people, <clears throat> and he's loyal to Christ and he's bold. So what a lovely truth we see there, that those who previously let the Lord down can have a change of heart wrought in them by God and become those who yet serve him the best. Remember John Mark, a young man who went with Paul and Barnabas on missionary work. He got fed up with the work and he went home and he let them down. But God gave him another chance and in the end he was profitable to the ministry. How badly had Samson let God down with his womanizing? How low he'd been brought. He'd become weak, he'd become blind. Yet he sought God for another chance and the Lord greatly used him. Wasn't it the same with Jonah? Jonah was running away from God. And there he was inside the whale with no hope, but he prayed that God would give him another chance, and God did, and he, he used him in a mighty way. So not only had Christ done a miracle for the crippled man, he'd done a miracle within Peter. So there were two men there, and there was a miracle done in both of them, but they could only see the miracle with the man who was crippled in the stand. They couldn't see the miracle in Peter, but there was a miracle done in Peter. No doubt there was something in his voice that had a ring of authority about it, and it melted them. But then we're told that they marveled that they were unlearned and ignorant men. It says that they could perceive this, meaning to say that it was an easy thing to detect that Peter and John were unlearned men. They could see that they'd not had a good education, that they came from a lowly background, they were, in fact, Galilean fishermen, ordinary manual workers who'd been called to leave that work and to serve Christ. It would appear that they hadn't attended school when they were boys and they worked with their dad as a fisherman and they got used to that. So they were learning a trade instead of being at school. They were unable to speak about mathematics and science, but they could speak about Christ. And even their speech 
was ordinary, never put on false words, never tried to make them sound felt, felt posh. You remember that? that? Those people said, we can tell you're a Galilean by your speech. Peter and John didn't put anything on to show off. But here's the bigger question. Daniel and I have been discussing this all day. Do you think that the Lord Jesus Christ, as a boy, went to school? Do you think so? It's a big family, wasn't it? Mary and Joseph had at least seven children. They were poor people. Unlikely they were um, well off enough to send their boy to school. And not only that, but later on, we, we, the, the Jews said, how, can, how come this man has letters having never learned? That's a big question there. Education is, a, is one of those things that people can take to one extreme or, or the other. To say this verse shows that Christians should see education as unimportant is stupid. Education is a good thing. It's a wonderful thing if it's truthful. Christians need never to be afraid of their children being taught the truths about earthly things as long as it's right. It doesn't matter what the subject is, as long as it's truthful, it cannot harm anybody. Education has brought about many benefits to mankind, not least medical science, cures and the healing of many people who would have died instead. But then, of course, there's the other extreme, the idea that education is the be-all and end-all of, of everything, and that without it, a person can't have a proper life or a useful life or a happy life. That, again, is stupid. It's pride. The acquiring of knowledge was one of the things that Solomon tried, and he said it was vanity and vexation of spirit. Surely education is only a means to an end. It's what you achieve by it not the thing itself. Lack of it didn't prevent Peter and John doing their work, nor did it stop them enjoying their life. But let's not forget who wrote this book. The Acts of the Apostles was written by Luke, who was a great physician. So he must have had a great education, mustn't he? He, he was a physician. Let's not forget that half the New Testament was written by the Apostle Paul, who also had a good education as he sat at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the great teachers of his day. And so it shows that God chooses and uses all types of people. And in one sense, these two apostles had been to college they have been to college with, with Christ for three years. They spent three years being taught by him. But it goes further than that here. It says they were ignorant men. Now to call somebody ignorant today would be derisive. But in Roman times, it meant somebody who was nothing special. Here were Christ's apostles filled with the Holy Spirit, said to be nothing special. And yet, in the end, these two men together wrote seven books in the Bible. Isn't that amazing? Seven books in the Bible were written by these two men who were said to be ignorant and unlearned. And those books are still with us today, 2,000 years later. Basically, Peter and John didn't know a lot about earthly things. That could be seen in them. But in the Christian life, the important thing is not what you know, it's who you know. Do you know the Lord Jesus? And this is precisely what's said about them at the end of verse 13. The leaders took knowledge of them that they'd been with Jesus. They had noticed them to be those who walked with Christ. Unlearned, yes. Ignorant, yes. Yet they'd been with Jesus and people could see it. Well, how could it be otherwise? Three years walking and talking with the Son of God, that's got to have registered somehow. People could see it. Here then is the acid test for every one of us. It's not how much we know. It's have we been with Jesus? Can people see this? Do people take notice that we've been with Christ? There's always a danger with Christians, and they're good people who get very involved with theology, fine, but they forget the person of Christ. They don't spend enough time thinking about the person of Christ. You've got to get on your own and just think about him.
be with Jesus. The person who's often in prayer, that's the person who's been with Jesus. Those who meditate on him and think about him. Verse 14 tells us that the man who'd been healed was standing with them. He was there as the evidence as to what had happened. But far from his presence indicting the apostles and showing their guilt, it only showed that, that they were innocent. It showed the greatness of Christ. The fact that it states that this man was standing is wonderful in itself, isn't it? Before he couldn't stand, but now he could. What a testimony he was to Christ. When somebody is truly converted, they're able to stand up for the Lord. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Ephesians says, having done all, we must stand. Take the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And notice those words, with them here. He was standing with them. He took his place alongside the apostles. He probably came to stand up for them. He could have probably walked away and kept out of all this. But no, Christ had made him a new man, both physically and spiritually. And, and he showed this by taking his position alongside Christ's people. The famous words of Martin Luther. Here I stand. I can do no other. In other words, this is the truth. I've given it to you. It doesn't matter what you do against me or what happens to me. I can do it. Nothing else but to give you the truth. It all shows that when somebody has had a true conversion, they join the people of God and they're found standing with them. They're found within the Christian church. They're found showing their thankfulness for what God has done for them. Now, it was the opposite with Judas, if you remember. When Judas changed sides, it says he was standing with the enemies of Christ. Notice also that it says here that they could say nothing against it. It was so obvious that the man was truly healed and much better off now than he was before. And this had to be something good. Maybe today a person has been wonderfully converted they're having a far better life than they've ever had before, but their relatives are against the Christian faith. And yet in their heart of hearts, they can actually see that the person is much better off and they're much happier than they used to be. And try as they may, they can say nothing truthfully against it. In verse 15, these leaders command that Peter and John go outside so they can speak about him in private, speak about them in private. The leaders probably felt convicted about their actions and they didn't enjoy looking at the faces of these two great men and they didn't want the apostles to hear them speaking to one another because they were embarrassed. They didn't know what to say. And so they began to confer amongst themselves what they should do, each man asking his opinion. And in verse 16 they ask, what should we do with these men? For it's obvious that they've done a great miracle. Now, of course, what they should have done was to repent and to turn to Christ, but that was the last thing they wanted to do. But when people refused to do the right thing, they would find it difficult to know what they should do. That's why society today, which is so ungodly, is always so confused because it's rejected Christ. These men realised that the whole of Jerusalem accepted the miracle, but they themselves were still intent on being against the disciples. How this verse disproves once again those men who teach that if people saw miracles today, that would turn them to Christ and follow him. There were many people in Bible days who saw great miracles. They didn't turn them to God. Judas again saw marvellous miracles. He didn't turn him to God. It's just not true. And no matter how many miracles the people of London witnessed, they would still not turn to Christ. These leaders here believed in the miracle. They say we can't deny it, but they still oppose the Lord and his followers. In verse 17, they decide to threaten the apostles so as to stop them speaking anymore about Christ. 
they would really have liked to have punished them in some way, but they haven't got the courage to do that because they fear the people turning against them, for the people knew of the miracle. How could they punish people for healing a crippled man, and yet they crucified the one who healed multitudes of people? The leader's main concern was that the gospel that these men preached would spread no further amongst the people. That's always the main motive of the devil to stop people spreading the gospel. Islamic countries imprison Christians, even kill Christians, because they seek to prevent the gospel being spread. But God sees to it that his word will have free course nevertheless. God and Satan have always battled over the spreading of the gospel. God sent forth his son, yet here was Satan using men, threatening the apostles, so that they would not speak any more about God's son. In verse 18, they call the apostles back and command them not to speak of Jesus. They gave them no reason for this. They couldn't say that anybody had been harmed by it. The real reason was that they didn't want their own hypocrisy to be shown up because they put Christ to death and they didn't want others speaking highly of him for that would show them to be evil. And there are people today who want to silence the truth because it shows them up as being evil. Christians have been told to stop, stop speaking about Christ when they're at work or when they're in other places or even when they're at home because it embarrasses people and it makes them feel uncomfortable. The apostles were now in a tight situation which needed a decision. The Lord had given them a command to preach the gospel. Go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But now these leaders commanded them not to do so. Christ promised to bless them if they did. The leaders promised to punish them if they did. So it can be with today's Christians. People tell them not to witness, but God tells them that they should witness. Christ said, don't hide your light under a bushel. But it's no wonder that Christians are sometimes hesitant about speaking up because the ungodly are so much set against it. In verse 19, the apostles answered the court and said, should we do what you say or should we do what God says? Well, they didn't have to make up their minds because they were filled with the Spirit and so they knew what God's mind was. And no threats were going to change them. They were only concerned about what was right in the sight of God. And they actually say those words in verse 19. You notice that? The sight of God. How important is that? The sight of God. They realised that God was looking down upon them and everybody is answerable to him. And this, of course, is always the question for us to ask if we really want to do what is right. It's not, what would this person think? Or what would that person think? It's what's right in the sight of God. What other people think about our life, it has some importance to us, and we do care about that, but it's not all important. But what is our life in the sight of God like? That's what's important. You may be a very popular person. Everybody thinks you're great, but does God think you're great? Or you may, may, have, a, you may have few admirers, but does God admire you? That's what matters. If we would copy the apostles, we must make sure that our decisions are done with the aim of doing that which is right in the sight of God. And these words, the sight of God, are important because it shows that God sees things differently to what people see. People look on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. He sees right through people. He not only sees what people do, he sees why they do it. And the apostles ask the court, who should we listen to, you or God? Judge ye, you work it out. And the Christian today should contemplate the same question. Who should we listen to? Unbelieving men and women or God speaking in his word? 
Later on in chapter 5, they say, we ought to obey God rather than man. But that's easier said than done in these days. In verse 20, the apostles state that they couldn't stop speaking about Christ. They'd seen him and heard him, and they would burst if they kept silent regarding him. So they made it clear to these leaders that they would not do what they were commanded to do. And they also showed that these leaders must be against God because it's a decision between you and God. Well, then, if God's right, you must be wrong. What audacity this must have seemed and how annoyed it must have made these leaders. As for the apostles, they would go on preaching for this they've been commanded to do by God. He'd made them stewards of the gospel and they could on no account keep it to themselves. The great prophet Jeremiah once felt that he couldn't carry on anymore. Nobody was listening to him. Nobody was taking notice of him. He was telling people the truth. He was telling people what God said, but nobody was taking any notice. So he thought about packing up. But then he found that the more he kept silent, the more God's message burned in his bones and he just had to give it out. The Holy Spirit being upon Peter and John urged them to spread the gospel far and wide. And those filled with God's Holy Spirit today will also be found telling others. And another reason why Peter and John must speak was because of their concern for the lost. Peter had stated that people must be saved, must be saved. So for them not to preach in that name would put a stumbling block in the way of people being saved. You can't just say to yourself, yeah, people must be saved. You've got to tell people that. They've got to know that. And so the apostles must warn people that without Christ, they would be eternally lost. And they realised that if they didn't spread the gospel, who would? I hope we can say at this church that despite our limitations and our failings, we have endeavoured over the years to give out the gospel of Christ in this area. Paul said in Hebrews, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Do we? In verse 21, the leaders threaten them again, but they could do no more than that. They had to let them go. They probably felt that they'd frightened them sufficiently to keep them quiet. Other men had been frightened by them and they had, they'd taken notice, they hadn't carried on speaking. But of course, they hadn't reckoned with the fact that these men had been with Jesus. Makes all the difference. And those who, who've been walking with Jesus will talk about him, of course. If you get to know Jesus more and more, you'll want to talk about him. It says that they could find nothing to pin on them so that they could punish them. And all the ordinary people gave God the glory for what had happened to the crippled man. They saw God's hand in it. Verse 22 tells us that the healed man was over 40. That's interesting, isn't it? You remember that it stated that he'd been lame from his mother's womb. He'd been born like that. He'd never walked ever. And now he's over 40. What a wonderful miracle this was. His age made the miracle all the greater. For the longer he lived, the greater the grip of his disease and the less likely it was that he could be cured. And this is also true in the spiritual realm. Sin is a disease that attacks us from our mother's womb and the older a person gets, the more it grips them and the less likely it is that they will ever be saved. Most people are saved when they're young. Very few are saved when they're over 40, like this man. But perhaps that's a message for somebody who's listening to me now. Perhaps you're over 40. Perhaps God has been speaking to you. And the great message here is that even the over 40s can be saved. The man was cured. It's as if it takes a greater miracle to save an older person than a younger person. Well, 
Well, this passage we looked at tonight teaches us the important truth that men and women are accountable to God directly. They are responsible for their own actions. For they have to obey God rather than man. And Christians today in certain countries have to face this big question whether to obey God or to obey man, knowing that persecution will come upon them if they obey God. Peter and John were threatened because they didn't accept the beliefs of their national leaders. There was no religious liberty. Let us pray for Christians in this world who are denied liberty to obey God. The Quran states that anybody who leaves the Muslim religion should be put to death, and many have been. And that's why you get so many nominal Muslims, people who claim to be Muslims, but they don't believe in it at all. But they wouldn't dream of, of saying the opposite. But we should seek to be courageous ourselves and to boldly stand up for our Lord wherever we are and identify ourselves with him whatever the cost. May we spend more time with Jesus and may others actually see this in us. Amen. Amen. Amen.